Hello again and welcome. You can see we have the Nano VNA out along with several spice manuals. So what I'm planning on doing today is using the Nano VNA to characterize a couple of different components. I'm going to create a touchstone file and then I'm going to take that touchstone file and I'm going to import it into spice and then hopefully use that component as part of a larger circuit which then I'm going to simulate. So basically the idea is if you had a component and you didn't have a model for it you could actually characterize that part on the Nano and generate your own model for it. The very first company that I worked for, we had a version of Spice. It ran on a VAX 11780, I think, or 11760. These are the original manuals from Berkeley. You can see this one dates from February of 1980. Simulation of MOS integrated circuits using Spice 2. And then I have this one, Spice 2, a computer program to simulate semiconductor circuits. This one is dated May 9th of 1975. At one point, the company I worked for bought a copy of P-Spice. I'm talking about the very original one. It ran on DOS. At that time, I think we had some IBM AT286 PCs, but I think we were still running some of the XTs when this thing came out. They had a laser burn diskette that you would have to have installed in the machine, and that was essentially their software security for it. I remember P-Spice actually being quite expensive when we first purchased it. What's kind of interesting is this Spice 2 would actually run on the PC. There wasn't the graphical front end. You would just enter your netlist in text form. And the graphs that this would actually produce were ASCII. I want to say the original P-Spice was like that as well. I don't remember there being a graphic engine for that. This simulator was sold by Daisy Systems Corp. This was the first mixed mode simulator I had ever seen. Basically what I mean is there wasn't a separate simulator for the analog as well as the digital. They were combined together into one simulator. One of the key features with this too is I remember this having a hardware simulator. This didn't run on a PC originally. This actually had I think a VME chassis that it was running on. There was physically a separate box that you could actually plug an IC into. I think what it was is you could actually take that IC then and use that as part of your model. It was very advanced for its time. Later on they actually had simulators that would run on the PC. That probably came around about the time that IBM released the IBM AT. This is a printout of a simulation I ran. What's interesting about this, this is not a laser printer. It had rolls of paper and you would tear these things off as it would come out. At one point in my career I was using Saber. This is a completely different simulator. As a matter of fact, it was designed from the ground up. So it's not compatible at all with the Berkeley Spice. This is also a mixed mode simulator, but this one a little bit further than our old mixed mode simulator. This actually allowed you to model mechanical components as well. Again, quite a nice simulator for the time. I think we ran this on a Sun workstation. I don't remember this actually running on a PC. You would have had to have been a very wealthy hobbyist to be able to afford this package. If you were a hobbyist, unfortunately there really wasn't a whole lot of options available to you if you wanted to run Spice. Microsim, who produced P-Spice, did offer a student version of it and they had a demo version. Both of those limited the number of nodes that you could simulate. So you could do like simple transistor, maybe an op amp circuit, but really that was about the extent of it. And of course we all know that Microsim sold P-Spice to ORCAD eventually and they still offer that tool today. I went out to their website a couple of days ago just to check. The current price for it is about $6,800 without tax. So unfortunately, to run these little experiments at home, it's out of the question. Actually, for home use, I did buy a couple of cheap low-cost spices. There's this one here. It was called TurboSim. And then later, that same company produced something called Visual Spice. These are actually pretty nice for what they were. I think that the cost on these was about $50. The guy who had developed the software was targeting college students with it. And I think really for that target group, this was a pretty nice setup. So at some point, I was reading an article on Spice, and it may have been an EDN or something. I tried to find that article, and I couldn't locate it. What the article was talking about was using a vector network analyzer to create a model that could run inside a P-Spice. So the way that that works, the network analyzer, including this nano VNA, creates something called a touchstone file. So the software that comes with this does support that file format. And that data is an industry standard. It can be read by other tools, including P-Spice. 
Peace Spice had something, I think it was called a black box model or something. Basically, you would import your touchstone file into that, and then that would give you a graphical representation of your model. You could plop that into your schematic and then include that with the main simulation. So when I was looking at their original software, I saw that it did support Touchstone. I thought, geez, do I want to add that to my LabVIEW software? And I thought the only reason I would do that is if I could get this thing to work with Spice. But again, I haven't been playing around with Spice in a lot of years. And the only one that I knew that could do it at the time was P-Spice, which again was cost prohibitive. So I posted a little bit about it on the EEV blog. And a few people chimed in about different simulators that actually support Touchstone. It turns out last month that Microcap had gone belly up and they offered their Spice Simulator free. You can just download that and it's the full blown version and there's no key required. I'll provide a link to that in the description. So what I'm going to do today is use the Nano VNA to characterize a part. I'll create a model and store that into a touchstone file, import that into the Microcap Simulator and then include that component as part of a simulation. So for this demonstration, I'm going to show some updates to my LabVIEW software to support the Touchstone format. So there's been a handful of you that have expressed interest in the LabVIEW code. So I'd like to talk about that a little bit. There's a couple of problems I see in releasing the code. A few people have written me that they didn't understand why I would use LabVIEW, especially if I want to distribute it. And so it could be that people are just not aware that LabVIEW can actually generate an executable. I can create a full installer. Uh, it would install just like any other program. So if I do release the code, the only OS's that I would support, it's either going to be Windows 10 or Windows 7. You know, I have no intention on ever supporting Linux, nor do I have any plans to support any Apple products. The biggest problem I see with releasing it is the amount of time I'd spend trying to support it. Again, I really wrote this software for my own use. It's really an engineering tool. It may look polished in the videos and, you know, has a lot of features and whatnot, but in its current state, it's not something that I would release to the public. One person that had expressed some interest in it, you know, they had asked. I said no. They asked again. I said no. And they said, you know, even if you don't support it, they'd like a copy. But I know that that's not the way it's going to work. If I release this code, there's going to be a level of expectation that I'm going to support it. And again, that's the problem. One of the things that has been mentioned is that had I chose to write it in Python instead of LabVIEW, the development time really wouldn't have been that much more than what I spent already with LabVIEW. And I want to be clear that I think when I first did the video, I was looking at about two days of work, you know, about 16 hours to develop that code. So I do believe that, you know, if you had somebody out there at New Python and, you know, they understood what a network analyzer was, I've posted a couple of things that I learned about the protocol on this. I got to believe if those people that are posting that are right, you know, and it took me two days to pop out my lab view code, even if it's double that time, say four days, it's not that big of an effort. So you guys that want to see this thing running under Linux and you want to see your Python code, I'd just say go out there and write it. You know, it's probably not that big of a deal. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so this is looking at the new software. What I'm going to do is turn off the auto. You can see I've added a few features here. What I'm going to do is uh, go ahead and hit SP1 load. And let's go ahead and we'll load up a touchstone file. So this file was actually generated off of a different network analyzer. And let's go ahead and I'll fire up a different program. This is going to be AppCAD. And again, let's select File, Open, and we'll just select the same file. And I'm going to plot my S11 and hit Calculate. So what I don't like about AppCAD is that it's not very feature rich, but you can see that the graph is basically the same as what I'm showing with the LabVIEW software. So what I'd like to do is simulate a small circuit and I think this is what we're going to simulate for starts. So this is essentially a 50 ohm terminator. Let's just go ahead and I'm going to attach that to our channel 0 SMA. Again this terminator is slightly different. You can see like I'm grabbing the body of the terminator. It's one of the things I don't like about the standards that they supplied is basically the body is locked down so you don't have a choice. You're basically rotating that center conductor when you're attaching those CAL standards. So I know it doesn't look like much of a circuit. It's a resistor, but bear with me. So what I'm gonna do is hit sweep, and then I'm gonna store this data into a touchstone file by selecting S1P save. 
So that's created the touchstone file, which is essentially an ASCII file. You can read that with a text editor. Let me just pop that open. And so this top line, you can see we're in hertz. So this first column is frequency. Again, you can see we're starting off at 50K. So the last value in the touchstone file was 899 megahertz. The touchstone file doesn't say that you have to use DB and angle. This is just one format. The standard also accommodates multiple ports. And again, if we go into AppCAD and select everything S parameters, select our file, open, and we'll load in our resistor. And again, we'll select the S parameters and calculate. You can see our S parameters being displayed on the Smith chart. Again, basically the same thing as what I'm showing on our LabVIEW software. Up at the top here, you can see 50 ohm, 50K, that's hertz to 900 megahertz SP1. This is the file that we're going to be working with. This is looking at the microcap simulation software. Here I've drawn a schematic. So on the left I have a voltage source and then I have a 50 ohm resistor and then I have our one port component. Let's just go ahead and select that. Unfortunately I don't think our frame capture is going to show this but here's where we can select our file, do the dot dot dot. You can see the software recognizes that that file is in the directory. We can just hit change and hit OK. And essentially then that's loaded in the touchstone file that we've created off of our Nano. So let's go ahead and we'll simulate this. We hit analysis and we'll select AC analysis. And what I'm going to do is sweep up to 900 megahertz. And this will be a log sweep. So let's go ahead and we'll select run. And on the left you can see again this is in decibels. And you can see we're just slightly higher than minus 6 dB. And again, that's looking at this point right here between our 50 ohm resistor and the device that we've actually entered, which happens to be a 50 ohm resistor. So if we divide essentially the voltage by 2, that is going to be a reduction of 6 dB. So obviously this technique will work for something as simple as a resistor. So I'm going to take this moment to thank my one and only Patreon flipper who sent me this Nano VNA. I know he in particular is going to look at this and say, Ooh, you know, you simulated a resistor. How complex was that? And I think I owe it to him to run something a little bit more complex. So I'm going to try to model a component that's going to be very non-linear. So let's go ahead and we'll get set up to run that test. So for this next experiment, what I've done is I've set up a small oscillator. This is just out of junk in the drawer. I didn't do any calculations on this. This is a 2904 transistors. There's a couple of 300 puffs. These are some 2.2 nanofarads, a couple of 10Ks. There's a 150 ohm resistor here. So essentially this is your bypass cap. This is our DC blocking cap here. And there's a inductor down here. So that inductor in parallel with this cap is making up the tank circuit for this. This is not put together for any kind of fidelity. It's not going to be tuned for the frequency that I'm going to run it at. So I've got a few different crystals here we can try. Let's just start with the lowest one. This one is 6.0 megahertz. Let's go ahead and install that. Again, I don't have any trimmer capacitors and I'm not really too concerned about the absolute accuracy. This one is a 20 megahertz crystal. And again, you can see it's off by about 500 kilohertz. So you can see I also have a 16 megahertz crystal. We can go ahead and install that. And you can see it's reading about a kilohertz high, 1.1 kilohertz or so high. So what I'm going to be doing is attaching a crystal to this small adapter board. And then we'll attach this to the network analyzer. And the part we're going to be testing, if you haven't guessed already, is going to be a crystal. The reason that I want to run a crystal is this is going to be a very non-linear device. And it's going to have a very sharp response at one particular frequency. If I can generate a touchstone file from this and then feed that into our simulator and we generate a 16 megahertz waveform, I think we'll consider this successful. So you can see I have our test board attached to channel 0 of the Nano. And I've installed our 16 megahertz crystal. You can see the starting frequency of the software is set for 50 kilohertz. The maximum is set to 900. Let's just go ahead and run a sweep on this. So the problem with this is that the Nano only collects 101 data points. And when you make this wide of a sweep on a narrowband part like this crystal, you know, you're really not going to get any useful information. So let's go ahead and we're going to dial this thing down. So what I'm going to do is set our starting frequency for 15.8. 
and I'm going to stop at 16.2 megahertz and now let's perform our sweep and you can see we end up with this sort of a pie shape and really this isn't what the part looks like at all either it's sort of like a digital oscilloscope you have some sampling rate that the thing can run at maximum and you can run into almost like an aliasing problem with this so what I'm going to do is tighten this down even further let's go to 15.9 and 16.1 and now let's perform our sweep you can see the pie shapes a little wider again we could do that with the center frequency up here I can just change this to 16 and let's just make this 100 kilohertz wide so that's going to be plus or minus 50 kilohertz off the center point now let's do a sweep you can see now it's starting to take shape it's looking more like an arc and that's really what we're looking for but if you look there's one two three four five data points basically out of the hundred or so that we've collected that actually form that arc so as I continue to make this smaller let's just go down to 10 kilohertz and now you can see we have this nice arc and this is really what we're looking for so to get around the 101 data point limitation of the nano I've added this feature I call it a narrow band sweep what this is going to do is it's going to take our starting frequency so let's set this back to 15.8 megahertz and again we're going to set this to 16.2 megahertz and again if I do the sweep this is what it looks like I'm going to leave the span set to 10 kilohertz now what's going to happen is when I select the narrow sweep it's going to start off at 15.8 megahertz and it's going to collect the first 10 kilohertz of data and then what it's going to do is it's going to move to the next 10 kilohertz of data and it's going to build this large array made up of those 101 sample segments and when this is done it's going to redraw the graph with all that data so again I'm still sweeping between 15.8 megahertz and 16.2 but with a much higher resolution so I just select narrow now this is going to take it quite a bit of time to run what I'm going to do is speed up the video for you so you don't have to sit through this So you can see now we have a fair amount of resolution. As a matter of fact, at the top of the screen here, you can see it's collected 3,939 samples. So of course a lot higher resolution than the typical 101 samples that the Nano provides. Well, again, the plan is to take this data now and create a touchstone file. So let's go ahead and do that. We just hit S1P save, and I store that into my 16 megahertz crystal file. So my next step is to create the schematic for this oscillator and microcap. And then again, we're going to import this touchstone file and run the simulation. And the reason that I want that higher resolution in that touchstone file is I'm hoping that that's going to provide us with a higher fidelity model. And hopefully that translates to a more accurate simulation. All right, so this is looking at our schematic. You can see I'm using version 12.2 of the microcap simulator. It'd be a little difficult to trace out. You'll notice that our DC blocking capacitor has not been included. So I'm looking right at the output across the tank circuit here. Again, this hasn't been calculated. This is just something I threw together. Again, the schematic basically replicates what I've built. This 2.2 nanofarad is essentially our bypass capacitor. The reason I included this was because I was a little concerned if the oscillator didn't fire up that basically I could draw too much current through the transistor and through this inductor I didn't want to damage it so I just used this to limit the current was all to the left you can see we have this end port we can select a different type so this would be a two port model three port or a four port so if I wanted to drag this into the schematic that would be our four port unfortunately the Windows capture software won't show the pop-up menus and then we can go to analysis and we're going to select the transient analysis and again unfortunately you can't see the pop-up but essentially I'm going to run it for 40 microseconds I'm going to start the output at 39 microseconds I'm going to set the maximum step to 100 picoseconds and you can see I'm just going to display the output voltage so let's go ahead and select run and now we have to wait again we can speed up the simulation by changing the step 
So for example, if I had set that at one nanoseconds, uh, simulation would be quite a bit faster. Of course, you're going to lose fidelity when you do that. And here's the end of the simulation. So if we counted the number of peaks across this, this is uh, one microsecond worth of data. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And of course it is a 16 megahertz signal. All right, so what I'm going to do is just zoom out. And you can see the two cursors are set on one period. And SPICE is calculating it's 15.947 megahertz. So fairly close to our 16 megahertz crystal. So hopefully now you have some idea of what you can use that touchstone file for. I don't know if I'm going to do anything more with it as far as my lab view is concerned. The next step would be to include a two port system where basically I could do some transmission testing with it. Basically what I'd like to be able to do with this is do all four S parameters with the two ports. And to do that what we would need is a transfer relay. And of course I'd need a way to drive that and you know it's Again, how much time do I really want to invest into this little nano? I may end up adding it down the road, but, but I think for now this is going to be the conclusion to my playing around with this little nano. So I hope you enjoyed all three videos. Until the next video, later.